Ryan Pohl's first draft class as Chicago Bears general manager won't make or break his tenure running the organization, but it will set the tone for how we view future draft classes and also some pretty important parts of this long-term team-building process. You are Locked On Bears, your daily Chicago Bears podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is Locked On Bears, and I'm your host, Lauren Cox. I'm here to bring you your daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. You can follow me on Twitter, at Cox Sports One. You can follow the podcast on Twitter, at Locked On Bears. You can like Locked On Bears on Facebook. Join the Locked On Bears Facebook group for even more Bears talk. And make sure you hit that subscribe button on the Locked On Bears YouTube channel to keep up with all of our video podcasts as well. Thanks for making Locked On Bears your first listen today. On the show today, we dive into what's at stake for Ryan Poles and Matt Eberflus from this first Chicago Bears draft class. We'll talk about now the utmost importance in this Bears defense, being good, if that's where those two second-round picks are going to be the emphasis first and foremost. We'll also look at some of the the what-ifs that this Bears draft class will follow, that if some of these other players the Bears had the opportunity to take but didn't take end up being really darn good, that's going to reflect pretty poorly on the general manager and the scouting staff for not taking players that if they end up better at other positions that maybe we would have wanted or seen not in hindsight but at the time as an option we might have preferred. Then we'll also wrap up kind of looking at, at how just in general this draft kind of will set the tone for future draft class and how we look at this general manager each year as far as the types of players he prefers, the types of successes and failures he has with these players, and what we should just expect year in and year out from this regime in the draft. And this idea of, like, the benefit of the doubt and what he can keep and what he might lose over time, depending on how this draft class continues to develop. All this is to say the draft class will take many years before we can really fully, truly evaluate how good these picks are. So these are not necessarily answers that we're going to get right away from this Bears draft class. This is longer term, bigger picture, what's at stake from these picks the Bears just made. And I think when you use your first second round pick at cornerback and your second second round pick at safety, when you had other needs, also needs on the roster on offense and around Justin Fields, I think the first thing to take away for me is that this defense and more particularly that secondary better be damn good if you're going to use both of those second round picks on those two guys. And there's a lot of reason to like Kyler Gordon. A lot of people saw him as a potential first round cornerback talent. The Bears didn't think he would be there at 39. The Bears didn't think Jaquan Brisker would be there at 48 to bolster that safety position next to Eddie Jackson. And so they're really sort of putting their stamp down on those two guys. That was really the quotes we heard from Ryan Poles earlier this week on the podcast was like, we thought, these guys were so special at their positions that we couldn't afford to either trade down or maybe, quote-unquote, reach for another player like a wide receiver or an offensive lineman, a player at a different position that they felt like wouldn't be as good or as impactful. That, that the, the feeling we get from Ryan Poles is that they had Kyler Gordon and Jaquan Brisker separately in a tier or their own tiers above the wide receivers, for example, that went a little bit after them, you know, George Pickens, Alec Pierce, and Sky Moore. But also, you know, some of the offensive linemen around that part, Cameron Juergens, uh, Luke Gedecki, and, and Ed Ingram were all drafted around there as well. Right? The Bears have all, all but said, like, yes, we thought these two defensive backs were significantly better enough that we felt like we couldn't move or take somebody else. We had to take those guys because we really think they could be special. Paul said we, we would be kicking ourselves if we didn't take those guys and they went on to be pro bowlers with another team. But I think the same can be true with <laughs> the guys they didn't take. If the guys they didn't take end up being pro bowlers on some other teams, and we'll kind of go through that a little bit more closely in, in a little bit here. But I think most importantly, like those two guys have to hit and that secondary as a whole needs to be good. That doesn't mean the secondary needs to be great 
this year in 2022, well, you know, we can be realistic about the expectations. Those guys should both be starters as rookies, and you want to see promising play and potential and growth there from them. But, right, we're not expecting Kyler Gordon and Jaquan Brisker to step in and be Pro Bowl players as rookies and give the Bears the best starting secondary in the NFL with Jalen Johnson and Eddie Jackson. No, that's not what we're saying here. But those guys need to develop, and this defense needs to really develop as a whole to be the focal point of the team the way that this offseason has made them. You know, when they spend a little more money on the likes of Justin Jones and Al-Qadeen Muhammad on the defensive line, Nick Morrow at linebacker as well, comparatively to the money they spent on the offensive line and the wide receiver, they've showed with their with their draft picks and their free agent dollars so far that they really believe in building up this defense almost more so than the offense. I mean, it's, there's a certain trust levels for, for the players they have versus the players they felt they had to, to play replace. It's not as though they're saying like, we really value defense over offense, but just more they felt like it was more important for them to assign those resources, more significant resources, to the defense. And so, as a result, that defense better be good. Like, that's what's at stake here, because if the resources they assign to the defense here in terms of draft picks and dollars don't pan out, it will then look so much worse for having also then neglected or not put as much resource into the growth and development of this Bears offense. And I think especially when you use two premium draft picks at similar positions in the same part of your defense, they need to hit and they need to codify that group and show that the significant investment those picks represent are worthwhile and can be a potential focal point of this Bears defense and this Bears team. Because if not, it's a it's a strongly poor reflection of the general manager. It'll be years before we know whether that's true or not, but that's the first sort of major stakes I see in this Bears draft class. I also think, as we were hinting at there and touching on a little bit, the whole wide receiver discussion, even more so than the offensive line discussion, as far as guys available in the second round, guys that we were looking at in the pre-draft process, and the Bears viewing as perhaps lesser than the choices that they did make. We'll kind of look at, at the stakes surrounding the players the Bears didn't take compared to the Bears players that they did draft next on Locked on Bears. We're coming down to it just a few more days until Mother's Day. And I'm telling you what, if you're still looking for that perfect gift, our friends at Blue Nile. Com. We're going to help you find a piece that mom will treasure forever. They're the original online jeweler. They've been doing this for a long time and making moms happy on Mother's Day every single year. They've got jewelry experts on hand 24 hours a day available via phone or chat to help you find that memorable gift at every budget. Whether it's the whether it's the the timeless piece, they've got classic diamond earrings, elegant tennis bracelets, birthstone pendants, and so much more at BlueNile.com. So this Mother's Day, give mom something she'll treasure forever with fine jewelry from BlueNile.com. Locked on Bears listeners are going to get fifty percent or fifty dollars off. Excuse me, fifty dollars off your purchase of $500 or more. This podcast exclusive is only good through Mother's Day. Use our promo code Locked On. That's L-O-C-K-E-D-O-N for $50 off at BlueNile.com. Plus, every order is insured, it ships for free, and it'll arrive in discreet packaging, so it won't give away what's inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever peace. Go to BlueNile.com today. We weren't thrilled when the Bears passed on some of the wide receivers in the second round that we thought they either should have taken or were definitely like in the conversation for those Bears picks, particularly with both picks. We, we got some relief, though, in the third round when they took Valus Jones from Tennessee, and it's their way of still being able to get some kind of playmaker and show us that, yeah, they're not like, you know, intentionally or directly uh, avoiding adding to the offense or building around Justin Fields or all these things that we've sort of seen those arguments for. We, we talked about it a little bit on yesterday's podcast about how it's not a, a direct reflection and, and all week long really about this draft class and how like it can be true both that the Bears made good picks and they could have done more around Justin Fields, but there's also a lot to like about Valus Jones and Tristan Ebner from Baylor and some of the offensive linemen. And, and we're all sort of kind of getting a, a, to know this draft class a little bit more 
deeply. But I think one, one of the main stakes that, that derives off of what we were just talking about in the last segment was like, yes, not only does taking those two second, secondary pieces mean your secondary better be good and pan out well, but you also better hope that you're right about those wide receivers that you didn't take not being great. I mean, yes, you, you don't want to like hope that a, a player has a bad career. We certainly want all the players to make as much money as they can and be successful. But from the Bears' perspective, right, they want to hope that that they are right and that those other players don't prove to be elite wide receivers. It's not necessarily fair to think that, okay, Valus Jones in the third round has to be better than George Pickens and Alec Pierce and Sky Moore. No, I mean, he was drafted at 71 compared to those guys at the early 50s for a reason, right? But it should track relatively relatively proportionately to like, Bayless Jones should, needs to still be very good, but can be slightly not as good as those guys to reflect the value of where he's drafting. But more so it comes to Ryan Poles kind of saying, he didn't list specific prospects or, or positions by, you know, specifically by name, but he did kind of say, you know, we felt like, the cornerback and the safety were a, a better playmakers and a tier above some of the other options that we had at that spot that we weren't going to reach at other positions of need. Sort of inferring that, you know, had they drafted or had they looked at like an Alec Pierce or a George Pickens or a Sky Moore, that that would have been a little bit more of a reach. And if one or more of those guys becomes, you know, an elite all pro wide receiver, that's going to reflect pretty poorly on the bears ability to evaluate and project those players properly. And I, I guess I am, I'm not including Tyquan Thornton here. Who the Patriots took at 50 right after the bears. Cause that's sort of, I mean, yes, he's in that conversation. It's probably unfair and rude to him to not include him there. Cause also we could throw in then John Mechie to the Texans and Wandell Robinson of the giants who went 43 and 44. All those receivers were taken when, where the bears could have taken them in the second round. But I really stick mainly here to Pickens, Pierce, and Moore, who were picked back to back to back at 52, 53, and 54, because, you know, in the lead up of the pre draft process, those were the guys more in the consensus of the Bears draft range. That there's a, there's a perception that, you know, Wandale Robinson and John Mechie might have been slight reaches at 43 and 44, and that Tyquan Thornton to the Patriots at 50 was even more of a significant reach to that spot. And like, I don't think we were expecting the Bears to take any of those three guys, whereas Pickens, Pierce, and Moore were all in that mock draft borderline. Well, Pierce not quite borderline first round, but in that sort of range of commonly selected by the Bears in mock drafts. doesn't mean if, if those guys turn out to be fine, decent NFL wide receivers. I don't think that's necessarily what you have to worry about, but I, I would be more concerned about like George Pickens becomes a dominant number one Pro Bowl type wide receiver or I mean same with Alex Pierce or Sky Moore right or Alex Pierce or Sky Moore but like especially that that idea of like if one of those wide receivers becomes something even better than what their draft slot would suggest for them right it's not so much like oh if they're not a bust it was a bad move by the Bears because like no you that you understand the Bears aren't saying by, by definition that they thought those guys would be busts and wouldn't be good NFL players but it's more so that they thought the players they did select will be significantly better or better enough to be worth taking over that position that you might also see as a significant need more directly impacting your quarterback. So I think any of those guys that were around the Bears range there, but especially those big three, would be the ones that you say the Bears were clear about not valuing them as much as the defensive backs they did take. And like, unless your defensive backs are also those types of elite players and you look in the future and say, ah, those other wide receivers turn out to be great, then that's a real problem. I, I would exclude Christian Watson from this conversation because the Packers, of course, traded up to 34 past the Bears in order to take him. And I don't know that it was realistic to expect the Bears to trade up to take Watson or any of those other potential second round wide receivers. And of course, any of the first round wide receivers, the Bears had no shot at drafting. So those those players panning out to be really great, I don't think would reflect poorly on the Bears and their ability to evaluate wide receivers and properly value which position they should take with those draft picks. But they need their defensive backs to be very good, and they need those other wide receivers to, to not necessarily be terrible, just not be elite. 
they also need Valus Jones to be good enough, right? They need him to be something. They need him to not bust out. And it seems like based on his skill set and the things, the speed, the natural speed and playmaking ability that he has, it seems very unlikely that he's just going to be a complete and total, like, bust, right? He's not necessarily a total boom or bust pick where it's like he, like, you know, like Dominique Robinson, the edge rusher from Miami of Ohio that the Bears took, that's a little bit more of a boom or bust thing when he's incredibly raw and, like, chance, I mean, he could develop into something great or he could never develop into something great and maybe never become all, all that much. But Valus Jones has at least, like, a certain baseline here, and all these wide receivers do, right? A certain baseline of, like, he'll at least be something. It's just a matter of how much he ends up being. Valus Jones does not seem like he's in the the build and mold and model of like be ever becoming a true number one wide receiver. I think, you know, the type of ceiling you're looking at there is more like the the Debo Samuel, which is like a great wide receiver and, and a, a perfect ceiling that you would want to strive for. I mean, if, if Valus Jones hits 77 catches and 1,400 yards, that'd be a home run pick in the third round, 100%. No doubt about it. I, I don't think of Debo Samuel, though, as the quote-unquote traditional number one wide receiver, but that doesn't take away from him being a pro bowler or anything like that. Whereas, like, you know, Christian Watson at 6'4 and running a 4'2 is more like that, you know, that true quote-unquote traditional number one wide receiver that, again, the Bears weren't in the range to do. So, so they need Valus Jones to be something decent. You know, even if he's a, you know, number three, number two type receiver, but a really reliable one, like, that would be, that would be fine and really help ease a lot of the burden of having missed out on or, or having opted not to take those other second round wide receivers. But the big pain and difficulty would be if those guys that they immediately passed on Pickens, Moore, Pierce become something truly special that they really should have then recognized and drafted at the time instead of a safety or a cornerback with those two second round picks. It's all, it's all really going to set the tone for future Bears draft classes as we sort of get to know the way Ryan Polis operates running this team. We'll, we'll talk about this idea of the benefit of the doubt and some of the trends we might look for in future draft classes next on Locked on Bears. Just because the NFL draft is behind us doesn't mean the football and Bears betting needs to be behind us. And our friends at betonline.net are going to be your number one source for all of your sports betting stats needs and information right now you can bet on futures odds for this season you know offensive or defensive rookie of the year the bears over under win total whether or not the bears will make the playoffs and you know futures odds on mvp and coach of the year and a whole, a whole bunch of different ways to spice the dice football plus our friends on at bet online have the, the betting information you need the developments the reviews the news on the basketball playoffs hockey playoffs just getting started major league baseball now th- for firmly in the swing of things, plus soccer, tennis, boxing, the Vegas casino games online, esports, live betting, and so much more. BetOnline is going to be the continued source for all of your sports wagering information. Head on over to their website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action you need to know. Bet online, where the game starts. How this first draft class pans out will really, I think, set the tone for how we view Ryan Poles' drafts moving forward, right? In this first draft class, for every general manager, they're going to get a certain benefit of the doubt, right? When they go cornerback and safety with those two second-round picks, it's not what we were envisioning, and it's not maybe what we would have done as amateur general managers watching the draft, but we know that... These are people who have spent a lot more time wa- talking, or I mean, watching these prospects who know more about football than we do, who have talked to these prospects in person, have done the background work and the digging, and we can say, you know what, they probably know better than we do generally. And so we can, for now, sort of trust them and say, you know what, we'll, we'll give you that benefit of the doubt that you can be successful and know better and, and do a better job with that. Now, as you see draft play draft picks either succeed or fail that tilts that benefit of the doubt that if Ryan Poles misses on those two second round picks for whatever reason which again doesn't seem particularly likely based on the prospects but regardless things happen that we can't we just can't anticipate then all of a sudden you have less faith and less benefit of the doubt in next year's draft or I mean next year will be too soon to know if those picks fail out but you know what I mean it, it sort of 
bleeds down the line on a few year delay into the future of like, oh, well, he got he got those picks wrong. So can we trust him on on these picks? And it's not just specific necessarily to those early draft picks, but it can be a trend in the opposite direction. You know, think back to, to Ryan Pace, right? That over the years, but especially it started early on in his first draft with Ryan Pace, but he we sort of grew to be able to trust Ryan Pace in the late rounds so always find some kind of draft gem with those picks. Pretty consistently, every single draft in the fourth, fifth, sometimes sixth round, he would be able to find some kind of player that was great value and would greatly succeed beyond what their draft slot might suggest. And that wasn't, you know, that, that was actually pretty quickly apparent even after his first draft when Adrian Amos was I, I think a not not quite a week one starter if I remember correctly like I think he you know I think he I think he started the first game like he wasn't day one starter in training camp but I want to say there was like he was competing the whole time and was a training camp standout but I feel like I remember there also maybe being an injury in there 2015 was was too long ago to remember the specifics but regardless Adrian Amos right away super successful as a fifth round draft pick even Jeremy Langford as a fourth round running back had some early success Ronis Grassu was in the starting lineup as a center fairly early on as well, right? Right. There was a lot to like even from the beginning with those late round picks. You get like Jordan Howard and Nick Witkowski in year two. Year three was Eddie Jackson and Tariq Cohen, right? I mean, we know, we kind of know the, the trend from there, but like it was a fairly immediate impact from some of those late round gems. We also saw some fairly immediate concerns over the bust potential of some of the early picks with Ryan, Ryan Pace's drafts. When, when Kevin White has the injuries, which is, we've done the Kevin White debate for seven years now. We don't need to necessarily go through how much was that Ryan Pace's fault, how much did he know, how much of that was just bad luck. Regardless, a miss, objectively, a a draft pick that did not properly pan out for the Chicago Bears in the top 10. And then you have Leonard Floyd being a little slow to develop, but eventually getting there. So that's, you know, kind of uh, one one half, half, half a dozen, six of one, half a dozen of the other. I mean, didn't really end up panning out fully for the Chicago Bears, but regardless, then you get the Mitch Trubisky pick and and all that. And so, like, there was some question about how those early picks would pan out. Adam Shaheen as well in the second round there. Jonathan Bullard is a third-round pick that fizzled out. Even Ronis Grasso, who had some promise at first, fizzled out there as as another kind of draft miss from Ryan Pace. And over time, we, we, we lost some of that trust in how those early picks would do, and we gained trust in how those later picks would do. And so... That's the kind of trends that will be set starting with this draft class for Ryan Poles in, okay, you traded and got eight day three draft picks. If none of them pan out, I'm not sure that we're going to have any sort of extra faith in, in Ryan Poles, you know, being able to find gems the way Ryan, Ryan, Ryan Poles finding gems the way Ryan Pace did. But, you know, if one or two of them really ends up being something above and beyond, then all of a sudden you can have more of that faith and maybe be more encouraged by, yes, trade down and get more of those picks because we want you to pick more of those gems the same way that we did with with Ryan Pace. I think there's also these ideas of like the, the players that they did pick in those spots being more of the athletic potential types with, with Velas Jones and his speed, the offensive linemen, three of the four of them are pretty, you know, big, long movers on the offensive line position. Uh, Tristan Ebner, the running back, also more of this pass-catching athlete out of the backfield as well. And then the safety that they took, converted cornerback from uh, from California, Elijah Hicks. Another one of these, like, great ball skills, athlete, potential type guys. That seems to be the preference for Ryan Poles. And depending on how those pan out, does Ryan Poles get the reputation of, oh, he just drafts athletes that end up busting? Or does he draft physical freaks that the Bears are really good at then developing into really good players, right? Is he is he taking moldable players and making them great, or is he is he overvaluing athletic tools and undervaluing, you know, refinement and technique and those other things that are very important to be successful in the NFL? That's what this first draft class will set the tone for and establish how much benefit of the doubt Poles continues to hold on to through these drafts. It's absolutely something he's given and is gifted at the beginning of his tenure and it's something he can continue to earn throughout but it's also something then that he can lose as things go on again i want to reiterate that will not be determined in the next nine to 12 months right it's not a a year one determination on on how these draft picks 
will pan out. But it is something we could sort of keep an eye on as the context to start their careers and watch them as they kind of develop throughout. You can be sure we'll keep a close eye on all of these draft pick developments right here on the Locked on Bears podcast. So make sure you hit that subscribe button on however you're listening or watching on the YouTube channel to keep up with all of our daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. We'll have some Locked On Podcast Network hosts joining us here soon. I'm still finalizing the exact date and times, but tentatively, I don't want to make promises here, but working on potentially tomorrow having our friend from Locked On Baylor to talk about Tristan Ebner first because he's the running back we haven't talked a ton about. And Drake Toll, the host over there, has been covering Baylor really well and, and I think has some good perspective on what he likes and also doesn't like about Ebner as a potential running back. Also been reaching out to our friends in the Pac-12 and then some some guys outside the podcast network as well, some other draft analysts that we really like. We're going to get this Bears draft class really broken down so we have the best possible understanding we can about these prospects. And I hope that as a result, learning more about these prospects in this post-draft time makes it just a little bit easier for you to bear down.